Welcome to the Web 2.0 Summit here in San Francisco. I have here with me Ann Wojcicki from 23andMe, which you founded not so long ago. Uh, not so long ago, about five years now. About five years. So in that time, how have the attitudes and social norms around people sharing their personal data and being interested in getting more information about the genetics changed? Yeah. So. Um, I, I, I'd say it's actually sort of reflective of what's going on with Web 2.0, social media in general, and mm -hmm. that people are increasingly more and more interested in, in learning about themselves and sharing, and actually, you know, creating with their own DNA and creating communities. And um, a significant percentage of our database shares their data, so it's it's one of those things we you, know, you look at HIPAA and mm -hmm. all the work that we do to try and protect privacy got a huge number of individuals who, who are saying, like, I'm really eager just for the world to, to be able to see my data and, and to learn from it. So you just uh, came off stage a little bit uh, mm -hmm. ago and we're talking about some of the insights we're getting into diseases from <laughs> that exact choice. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are some of the social benefits to being more open about something which is, frankly, mm -hmm. pretty personal? Mm -hmm. So I think fundamentally the reason why we started 23andMe is that we believe that by having big data sets, and bringing huge numbers of people together, especially people who have a common illness or a common condition, mm -hmm. we're gonna be able to learn about it. And by learning more about it, we'll prevent, potentially be able to either prevent it or have an effective treatment that will treat it. So one pharma company, one academic, one institution, they're never gonna be able to get enough data I think to effectively solve the problem and I think that's the real benefit of 23andMe. We have, you know, we have a community in sarcoma, we have 600 people, mm -hmm. there's no other academic center or pharma company that has 600 engaged individuals, um, you know, talking about their disease and participating in research and I think that's where we can get much larger numbers and our hope is that we can really solve problems for people that are very personal and meaningful to them. Mm. How I'm sure you're aware of and following what's happened with that patients like me. Do you sure. ever see any integration between the two? There's a lot. You know, we know them pretty well. Um, there's a lot of things I really respect that they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but fundamentally, for 23andMe, our core is really on you know using the genetics to understand why some people are responding to a drug, why they're not, um, are there genetic associations with the disease. So genetics is really core to to everything that we do. Okay. So uh, one of the discussions that comes up here is, is the decreased cost of so many things, of processing, yeah. of storage, of networking. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's so much that is much cheaper, especially now it's distributed out in virtual clouds yeah. somewhere. So uh, how have those, uh, uh, some of the, the similar trends uh, changed the cost structures around genetic testing? How's that affecting what you do? It's having a huge impact on us. So um, we started originally offering 50,000, uh, sorry, 500,000 markers to individuals for $1,000. And we just launched a couple weeks ago, or we announced that we will be launching an exome sequencing product. Um, so we essentially you're getting 50 million data points now um, for $1,000. So the technology mm -hmm. has really evolved mm -hmm. and full sequencing is is you know essentially here and um, you know people are we've had a fabulous response for having for our sequencing product uh vast transition it's a vast transition and it's a lot of data that's where it's a nice convergence being in silicon valley with all these companies because data management is is an issue mm -hmm. and how are we going to start to analyze and store this much genetic data especially because we ask people survey questions and we're collecting a ton of data um you know about people's health and and, and traits so analyzing all that data is, is a challenge, and that's exciting. So there's a pretty strong uh, social mm -hmm. good side of this. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the business opportunity? This mm -hmm. is not a, uh, a nonprofit that's foundation supported, sure. right? So we, I think we always look at things very much from, from our perspective. I'm a, if I'm an individual with Parkinson's disease, and you know my husband is at risk for Parkinson's, my mother-in-law has Parkinson's, what do I want? And primarily what I want is I want to give her an opportunity to participate in as much research as possible, move the needle forward, but I really want to spur competition. Mm -hmm. and, and there should be a lot more competition on these early stages. But at the same time, I recognize that she's not going to be really helped and my husband won't be helped if there's not commercial opportunities too. So we definitely, we want to encourage all of the academics, pharma companies, biotech companies, devices, to be able to leverage everything that we're doing so that there's significantly greater potential on the market for her. And I think that will, you know, the but be the best of both worlds. How does that filter down in terms of giving access? Does that mean uh, APIs? Does it mean op open data policies? Does it mean uh, 
open access to the, the research that's coming out of it. Mm -hmm. So we, we can't provide complete open access because we have to also respect our customers' privacy, mm -hmm. um, and that's first and foremost to, to the business for us. Um, that said, um, we have policies like we have only published in um, the Plaus journals, so mm -hmm. the Public Library of Science, because those are open access journals, and we feel very strongly that all of our customers should have access to the research that we are generating. Um, we have been very aggressive in terms of um, meeting with the appropriate academics, appropriate groups, mm -hmm. about sharing data and the discoveries that we have. Uh, we have an active blog where we have you know, decided we're not going to publish um, certain findings and we're just going to put them out on our blog. So we've been pretty aggressive, I think, at trying to get the data out there and core to our mission is making sure that our customers realize they are contributing to research and that we're making these findings. So, last question, mm -hmm. and it's sort of a, um, a, a big sky one, but you've been in, immersed enough to be thinking about some of the issues. Mm -hmm. What are the biggest concerns you have about the future of personal genomics? You know, there are a number of ways this could work out. Mm -hmm. You're a fan of science fiction, so we know mm -hmm. about some of the dystopias that exist. Yeah. Uh, you could anticipate um, certainly someone getting a genetic fingerprint at birth, which mm -hmm. someone can view as deterministic and mm -hmm. could affect their life you know, opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, Gattaca is a, a film that people might be familiar with mm -hmm. that has, you know, deals with those issues. Um, how are you sort of thinking about that? What are the potential pitfalls and, mm -hmm. and how would you think about um, guiding us towards a somewhat brighter outcome? Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of things. One, education is, is key for 23andMe. It's a huge focus for us. It's part of the reason why we created videos like the Genix 101 series. Um, we have free demo accounts. We give away a ton of kits to individuals where we feel like we just need to educate them about genetics. So my concern, I'd say, is actually much more benign than any kind of sci-fi story where um, the biggest problem today is that you might get your genetic data, but that the community of healthcare practitioners around you don't know how to use this data. And um, again, much more benign, prevention is one of those areas. If you walk into your physician now um, and say, I'm high risk for type 2 diabetes or for Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's, they're not going to know what to do. And that's fundamentally what I'm trying to change is I would like there to be some kind of prevention or some kind of focus on how do you prevent Alzheimer's? How do you prevent type 2 diabetes? And I think the system right now is a challenge because everyone can make money once you have a disease, but no one makes money off preventing a disease. And I think that's something that needs to change in the healthcare system. So that's the big boogie for me. Okay, yeah. that's a great place to leave it in terms of incentive structures and thinking about where they might exist or not. Yep. All right, thanks so thanks. much. Thanks so much.